Hi, I'm Matthew Quinn from Future Sales Factory. Welcome to another one of our Business Roots Chats. I'm here with Chris Newlands. He's the Chief Executive and Founder at SpaceEye. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? Matthew, I'm very well. How are you? Yeah, really well. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me along. Oh, it's a pleasure. Great. So tell us about SpaceEye. What's it all about? SpaceEye is um, um, it's the top co-name for it. So effectively, it's to do with eyes on space. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the spelling is A-Y-E, so it has a Scottish uh, tilt to it, if you like. Mm -hmm. Really, what we do is we look at satellite imagery in a different way. No one else in the world is doing this. So we're looking at what's in the satellite image and the interaction between people, animals, uh, assets, um, um, and the satellite image itself, so uh, through user-generated user content. So fundamentally, it's about the ability to engage, monitor, um, and interact with what's happening within. So for example, if you're looking at a, a forest fire mm -hmm. um, or um, a, in California, um, we're focusing on the firefighters within that area so that they're safer and the people that are there rather than just the smoke as such. So it's the interaction between uh, the user or the person within that imagery and real-time satellite. So you can actually see a firefighter in a forest fire from space? It depends on a number of factors. It depends on how clear it is. Uh, so you'd always be an ant, to be fair, from mm -hmm. space. Obviously, very often there's a lot of smoke as well. So we rely on things like GPS. So okay. fundamentally, the ability to actually identify a person would be on a wearable, potentially, or some sort of camera function. that would, It would ping a GPS signal. Uh, but actually, it also includes biometrics. It also includes audio and visuals as well. Wow. So let, let, let's put this into a, into a kind of a... a a me situation. So yeah. I, I like walking in the pills, doing Munros and stuff okay. like that. Yeah, yeah. And the wilder the better. Yeah. I've got one of these things on my wrist. Yeah. Some form of tracking device yeah. or whatever it might be. A garment, for example, yeah. A garment so, or whatever yeah, it might yeah. be. Yeah. And I'm walking up and I slip down a crevasse. Yes. Uh, and I break my leg. Yes. Um, and I make my last phone call, not my last ever phone call, but you know, before my phone dies. <laughs> <laughs> they yeah. make a phone call just yes. before my phone dies saying I'm, I'm stuck and then the phone um, goes dead. Your satellite can not only figure out where I am, because that's GPS, yeah. and we can do that anyway. Yep. But it can zoom in and it can give uh, a, a kind of uh, rescue services an idea of the equipment they might need. Yes. It can give a rescue services of the medical equipment they might need, yes. um, where I am, how whether I could get there by helicopter, all of that kind of stuff in, a, in the blink of an eye. Well, the, the, the capacity is increasing all the time. So just now, roughly every 40 to 50 minutes, a satellite passes over with uh, imaging capabilities. Right. By 2025, that'll, that'll be every seven minutes. And by 2029, we believe it'll be every 15 seconds. Wow. So you're looking at a huge increase in capability and, cap and capacity. So fundamentally, it depends on when the satellite passes over. So it's a bit like op opening up your app on your phone yeah. that says, where am I in a map? And that blue dot says you're in Edinburgh, let's say, mm. yeah, or on, on the hills, pretty Potentially. So we can identify that. So well, that's really important. That example is really important because fundamentally GPS has a tolerance level. Yep. Uh, so actually GPS in its own right, if it's only in a map, doesn't give you enough information. But your imagery will? Yes, it will. Okay. How can this save the planet? So I, I think we can make better, more informed decisions. So a quick example, and it's a it's a crazy example in some ways, but I, I imagine it's a really sunny day in Scotland, which doesn't happen that often. Let's be clear. What are you talking about? I mean, <laughs> so you've got a choice of St Andrews, uh, Loch Lomond, let's say, or Air Beach, let's say, as well. And you could see that potentially in real time and see actually the, how busy the roads are, mm -hmm. uh, rather than driving around all the beauty spots, actually deciding which one to go to. If you think about um, the ability from a maritime perspective to actually track a ship and see who's polluting the ocean, potentially as well right. yeah, yeah. Um, and who's been efficient in, in terms of that too so, so this has got um, uh, abilities within health and safety yep rescue services yeah environmental services yeah law and order I guess yeah, yeah very much so yeah anti-terrorism 100% you know, I mean, it, it, that's five just off the top of my head. There's yeah. probably another five if I start to think about it, another five after that. So yeah. it, it, this has got loads of uses. I, I think it will touch every single, <clears throat> uh, in fact, we believe it will touch every single sector, Matthew. Uh, so there's a myriad of use cases uh, for this. So agri-tech potentially too, uh, logistics, um, I mean, virtually anything you can think of, but even just something as simple as mapping, the ability to be at the Mardi Gras and actually be able to see where the busy streets are and avoid those if you want to avoid them. So there's a the social element as well. 100%. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Superb. And this is based in Scotland? Yeah, we're based in Glasgow, actually. So um, space has a Scottish accent. 
in the sense that we produce uh, more satellites than any other country in Europe. I think we're the third largest supplier or manufacturer of satellites in the world is, uh, is in, in, in Glasgow, in, mm. the, in, the, in the west of Scotland. Uh, in the east of Scotland, uh, the data downstream aspects of things and the anal analysis of that data through artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning is very much in Edinburgh, uh, downstream side of things. So we, some, we sit somewhere in the middle, if that makes sense. So mm. we're very much interested in space, but we're a downstream organisation. Um, and the ability to take that visual data, which is really, really powerful, and turn it into something that's really, really useful, uh, could actually change how we live our lives potentially going forward. Fantastic. I mean, and you're clearly very excited about this. this, is, this is, Never a guess, would you? Never a guess, no. So, yeah. so tell me, how, how did you get into this? What, what's your actual journey? Let's go back to 12-year-old Chris. Yes. Um, wandering around the place. Did you go... I what I think I'll do is sort out some satellite imagery when I'm older. Or um, where did you get to? Not exactly. Um, no, no I, I was very clear I wanted to join the Royal Navy mm -hmm. um, from a very young age. I used to read commando books, if you remember those. Oh, the, 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 um, that is the best military marketing spend ever. Ever. It was when they start, started actually putting advertisements on the television, Yeah. When I was in the army, yeah. I, I, I remember saying to one of my bosses, yeah. "Forget that, just just invest in commando books because yeah. that's what that's what made us do it." Yeah, yeah. I read, read all through that, so I learned a, a few German words of "Achtung, Herr Stumme yeah. Führer" yeah. and <laughs> all, all that stuff. Yeah. So honestly, it was um, th that probably inspired me in many ways, and I travelled my blood, and I felt that the Royal Navy gave you that ability, yeah. the great funnel line, mm -hmm. if you like, to be able to travel the world. And um, I've now seen over sixty countries, so I think. Um, uh, I definitely still have travel in my blood. Now, when I joined the armed forces, uh, I probably didn't realise how young I was. I was 16 at the time, so I yeah. left school at 16. I was sitting five hires in, um, in my fifth year, and the call came through. At that time, there was youth, youth opportunity schemes, EOPS yep. and yep. YTSs, uh, and they were paying you £30 a week or £40 a week, which was terrible at the time. Um, but the call came through that I'd actually passed the entrance exam, and I was uh, due to join on October the 4th, 1982, just after the, the Falklands conflict, yeah. and um, which I joined uh, and the, the, the Royal Navy at that point. Um, stayed for six years. Um, there was a conflict situation where we get attacked by a nice missile just outside uh, the FIPS, the Falkland Island uh, Protection Zone, in 1983-84. Uh, so that was never reported upon at the time, but it was a bit scary, as you probably can imagine. And a 4.5-inch gun shot out of the shrapnel shell but, and, and blew up the, the rocket. Um, so that's real stress, that's business stress, when actually yeah. there's a, a missile coming at you as such. Um, so I joined the Royal Navy. Uh, my father was a financial advisor. Uh, I saw his wage packet, decided that that would be, for me, I, I was earning four times more than, than that I was at the time. Uh, I think by the age I was 24, I'd left the Navy at 22. I was on the same salary as a commander at that time, so it was really, it was a good career move for me, and, yeah. and I really enjoyed it. I thrived with the complexity, and whenever there's complexity, you can make money, I suppose. Um, and it taught me a lot about in people skills and interacting with yeah. people. And, so, uh, so let me just get this straight. You, you Royal Navy from 16 to 22. Yes. Okay, so, so six, six years. Yes. Um, you leave and become a financial advisor because yes. that's what your dad did. Yes. And and the trip to financial advisor rocketed your salary to to the level of commander. Yes, in, yes, in right. terms of salary equivalent yeah. at that time. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so at that time, it was it was going. You were being a financial advisor was probably a stretch. You were a, a, an insurance man back in the day, yeah, right? yeah, so yeah. That, that's yeah. fine. You then had to sit professional exams. So mm -hmm. I sat my chartered um, financial planning exams, which is a degree. Um, 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 Bachelor of Arts um, um, Honours Degree. Uh, it took me seven years, uh, studying from the uh, the time of five in the morning to seven in the morning every day for seven years, mm -hmm. which is quite legendary in my family. So um, there's an element of resilience and determination and yeah. discipline that I think I got from the armed forces. Um, and uh, passed my, my degree um, and became chartered during that time. Uh, so my career went from Royal Navy, financial advisor, um, and um, into entrepreneurship thereafter and into the space sector. So you, right, so the jump was from financial advisor straight into the spec. Now that seems like a big jump. <laughs> that, seems was, like, that's yeah. a, that seems like a, a giant leap for mankind. Yes. yes so, so you did. Uh, a, <laughs> so you did a giant leap from the financial. And how, so how old are you at this point? So when, when I moved into entrepreneurship, I would mean it was ten years ago now. So I was forty six uh, at that time. Right. So you spent quite a while as a financial advisor. Uh, I, I, I'm still technically red. I'm not registered as a financial advisor, but uh, so 1988. Uh, up to no, 2013, so that was what 25 years or so. mm -hmm. 
uh, as a financial advisor. Uh, I was a non-exec director um, for a, a financial services firm as well. Okay. Uh, I had a really good career actually and I didn't want to leave the career necessarily but um, my son came in, um, uh, my stepson in fact came in and said um, I've got this idea uh, for a, a business model and it was uh, this idea of a social platform for travel. Um, so, so yeah we created Talk, Talk Holiday uh, which was this social platform for travel. We had a uh, part of the site which was about tra being tra uh, travel safe, it was called, mm -hmm. where you could lock away your details of your passport and your EMI, e EMEI number for your mobile phone yep. um, and all of that. So if something really catastrophic happened, you'd somewhere to go to to access your information, which was a free of charge as well. And we offered all the various uh, travel firm services on there too. So really interesting stuff, yeah. But it got to a point where we became consciously aware that if um, a, an Expedia or a Facebook wanted to replicate this, they could do that overnight. Yeah. So um, I then met a couple of space scientists who informed me that if you could find um, a, a business concept that effectively uh, utilised uh, satellite imagery or satellite data, data from space, um, then uh, you could apply for grants. And if you've been raising money for a long time, grants are quite attractive at that point. So, uh, so I said, great idea, guys. What ideas have you got? And they went, none. I went, oh, <laughs> God's sake. So, so I sat there and I just fact-finded. I it, it, it could have done the same in Google to some degree. What's the, the biggest, the fastest, the, more, the highest resolution? What can you see from space? The, the, all of that. Uh, and I went away and thought about it um, for a couple of weeks. Um, and I came up with this concept of changing talk holiday to tripsology. So looking at uh, more real-time satellite imagery, um, maybe 30 days old. Mm -hmm. So you can see construction happening around the hotels. Uh, right. The place you went to five years ago that was on the edge of town is now in the middle of town. How tidy the beach is. All of that, yeah. How much marine life there might be around, all of that kind of thing. Hey. So when you say you met some space scientists, yes. that, that sounds like a sentence that I've... Never heard before. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. Where did you meet the... Is in Edinburgh, it? actually, to be fair. Um, I mean, there were nice nice guys, don't get me wrong. We, we, we had a long conversation about a lot of things at the time, but um, fundamentally... Um, they were focusing on something else and I mm. decided to. So I came up with this other concept. I was in the shower, literally in the shower, because what I was thinking, the problem with building a business in many ways and being an entrepreneur is you have to build the business, you have to market the business, yeah. you have to go to Facebook, Google, TripAdvisor, Twitter, and Twitter and actually pay them to market your business effectively. So yeah. I was thinking, how can I get big brands to um, promote themselves through us rather than actually going to social platforms? Um, so I was starting to think, what else would the big brands want to do? They want to engage with younger people to some degree as well, because that's the next generation of, of people buying their products and services. And they think differently from my generation. Mm -hmm. They're not interested in having 10 Ferraris and 10 Rolexes. They want experiences. Yeah. So I was thinking, what, what, what experiences could you capture from space? Uh, and I started thinking about um, selfies. What else did they do? So I thought, space, yeah. selfies, selfies from space. Is that a thing? So I literally dragged myself, ran downstairs and looked it up and there was no such thing out in the market. So um, I, I then approached Airbus and a company called Digital Globe, which is part of my, um, uh, Maxar Group. Uh, they supply satellite imagery, the highest definition you can to the US forces. Uh, and Airbus do it for NATO effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in non-compete uh, confidentiality agreements. Show them the concept and they loved it. Um, so we decided to build the concept. We launched it in um, November 2019, just before COVID kicked in, mm -hmm. uh, on a BBC documentary. Um, and we captured the words at now. Uh, it was to do with plastic pollution on a Balinese beach from space uh, in, a, in a BBC documentary about two youngsters who had convinced the, the governor of Bali to ban single-use plastics. Okay. Uh, so we paid for, we fed an entire village for a, for a, a week. It's called a bungi, which I think the word bung comes from in some, in some yeah. ways. Uh, and they all dressed up in their, in their uh, local garb and stood in the words of, uh, it was 300 metres worth of uh, white cotton, and the words act now on a black um, uh, beach as such. And that took us um, from the documentary to the top 10% of all app downloads in history in a single week. Wow. So we thought, oh, that's interesting. Mm. And then COVID kicked in. So that, that all the events that we were talking to just stopped at that yeah, point yeah. as well. Um, but during all of that, we started to apply for a patent. And the patent was granted uh, in the US in March 2021, backdated to 2018. Right. And the patent's much bigger than Spelfi as such. Uh, and that's uh, there's a lot more to be shared about that as well. But fundamentally, we 
technically control the relationship between uh, your location, any data from wearables, any biometrics, any audio and any visual, be it video or static imagery, and the interaction with real-time satellite imagery right. is our patent. Well, and Spelfie is Space Selfie. Space Selfie, yes. That was the original kind of yes. idea. So right. currently Spelfie is aimed at large-scale events. Okay, so imagine Glastonbury or imagine right. um, a, a Wimbledon potentially. So the sponsor would pay for that. There's a, the, the cost of satellite imagery, ultra-high defi definition satellite imagery is expensive. Hmm. To task a military-styled um, satellite that's worth $200 million to take, take a single of picture of you on top of ben Lomond. for free is, is maybe a stretch <laughs> to some oh, degree. Yeah. That's terrible. <laughs> but with the capacity increasing so greatly from, uh, it was 142 satellites, uh, imaging satellites, I think back in 2014, there's now almost 1,000, and there'll be the best part of 4,500 by the end of this decade. Mm -hmm. uh, then, obviously, with a glut of uh, satellite imagery, uh, capacity increases, but costs come down. Yeah. Uh, so the, the model that's will why change. Going past every fifteen seconds by the end of the century. Yes. Yes. End, end of the decade. End of the decade. End yes. Of the decade, end of the decade. Yeah. yeah. So fundamentally, that means that it will change the commercial model. So, uh, and we are currently influencing that just now mm -hmm. about how we could change the the business model that would effectively um, make it sensible for all parties in the value chain, uh, and the consumer would probably be advertised to potentially, but they would have yeah. free access and be able to take that picture. Well, it's data gathering, isn't it? Yes. If, if, if I'm at Wimbledon, yes. if Wimbledon has sponsored it, and I look up and there's a photograph and it's me and I put some hashtag on it, and then there's lots of things that happen then. Yeah. Firstly, Wimbledon's getting advertised. Secondly, whatever's behind me, you know, a Rolex yeah. sponsor's getting advertised. Yeah. Uh, Wimbledon know that I've been to Wimbledon. Yep. Yeah. They could start selling me more tickets for all yeah. that kind of stuff. They're like, you know, all of this, there's just tons of things that can come. We, we are almost the product, aren't we? In some yeah, ways, exactly. yeah, as yeah. far as that's concerned. So I think we all understand the world we live in just now. And yeah. there's everyone gets served different adverts subject to your demographic and your interests as well. Um, and that's kind of what we've all signed up for to some degree, yeah. So, but you have to sign up for this privacy sacrosanct. So, if you have a Strava app and you want to pull in your actual journey you've just taken, but in real time from space, that will be a possibility going forward as well. Well, so so where next? What's what's the next plan for this? Where's this whole? Whole thing going. So, so we we are in talks with some huge organisations just now, as you probably can imagine. But we're looking at this from a societal perspective as well as a commercial perspective. Things like, in, in our view, things like people trafficking, wildlife poaching, vulnerable adults, vulnerable children, uh, anti-harassment scenarios where yeah. somebody's running in a park and in five years' time, we'll press a button that says, back away, you're now being recorded from space. Uh, I, you can see how people will feel a bit more secure and safe uh, using this in, in, a, in a different way. If you lose your child on a beach with a thousand people, the ability to press a button and say, John is actually standing beside the red tent mm -hmm. and not looking at a map, if that makes sense, will make a difference in that sense as well. So societal, I think there's a lot we can do there. Um, in terms of commercial, I think the ability to have a map that shows you where you are at any given time in, in its simplest terms. If you look at SatNav, if you, the ability to see something and all you see just now is a red line, does that mean that it's impassable, it's closed, um, or the traffic is getting by that, that scenario? I think that will transform things. The ability for an ambulance to, if there's a pop-up road block, let's say, to understand that that's there and then have a diversion that gets to you 30 seconds earlier, mm -hmm. then that could be the difference between saving a life and losing a life, potentially. So it's, this sounds like a fascinating story, and it, it's, it's all kind of happiness up to now, but there must have been some challenges. So what, are you, what, are, what, what challenges have you faced along the way? What stopped you? Um, I think as a business, uh, you're always fundraising um, and, and mm -hmm. partnering. Uh, personal challenges. Um, unfortunately, we lost a wee boy. Um, so that was, uh, even though it's quite tough to be honest with you. So, so um, bear with me. Um, so that that that's um, the ultimate challenge in many ways. Um, and you don't understand the impact that has on you uh, no. at that time. So um, I do this for him in many ways as well. So. Um, and we do want to make a difference, and mm -hmm. we're all going to lie on our deathbed at some point. So, your job, as far as I'm concerned, is to leave a legacy that you're proud of. Um, yeah. So, um, so that was tough, um, and that's where I think you have to have that resilience or that 
bounce back ability. The ability uh, to bounce back. The ability yeah. to bounce yeah. back. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, I've found that really tough on yeah. so many levels, as you probably can imagine as well. And that affects family life. It affects obviously your work life as well. So. Uh, but it also drives you and it makes you focus on what's really important in life. And um, it's not about having time for that, it's about genuinely making a huge difference. And I think that is really important. It's a really, really good way of putting a more positive angle on something that's that's horrific and terrible. You know, you've got this yeah. you've, you've got this drive now that goes, this, this I want I want to I want to do this for him, I want to do this for people like him, yeah. I want to do this for people who've had the experience the same as me. And 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 it that that's made a real connection for me because now I can see where the safety comes in and mm. where the where the, the social aspect comes in. So I think that's a really um brave and phenomenal thing to do. So well done you for that. It's uh... and thank you for sharing that as well. Yeah. It's, um, do you know, in all honesty, he had Edward Syndrome, which is not conducive with life, was mm -hmm. the phrase he used, which is mind-blowing. So yeah. he lived for three days, and um, it, the condition he had, it meant effectively he, he, he stopped breathing over 100 times, yeah. and that was horrific. Yeah. Um, so, um, But then my wife ended up with PTSD in the back of that too, which is something that you can't yeah. live with that too. So anyway... Try not to get too emotional about it, but fundamentally, it's a driver for me, yeah. uh, and I want to make a difference as well as make some money for my shares, shareholders and investors as well. So, and they understand that too. So, we are we've set up a charity in his name. His name is Robbie, Robbie's Room Foundation, and we want to create um, respite function that uh, families can go to and uh, get a break because had he survived, we'd have needed that break as well. To be honest, so yes, yeah, uh, yeah. at that time too. And our best friend's daughter severely autistic, and we understand the strains that has in the family, and mm -hmm. uh, it really has been a, a journey for them. And uh, we would have uh, obviously lived through that too. So uh, that's probably the biggest hurdle that we've had to deal with. Uh, and I think between the Exocet um, scenario, if you like, back in my days in the Navy and that, everything else is contextualised uh, with that to some degree too. And so life's not that bad necessarily. Last question then. Yes. Chris, uh, imagine you've uh, you've gone back in time. You've bumped into the young 12-year-old Chris Newland. Okay. Sitting, sitting on a park bench reading a commando book. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All yes. Which I did. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Eating some spangles. Yes. And uh, and and you give this 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 young young boy some some advice. What's the best bit of advice you think you can give the twelve year old you? Um, on reflection, uh, everything I've done has led me to where I am today. Mm. So every experience I've had, every um, and you don't know really know what the, the, what life has in in, in in hold for you in many ways as well. Um, I just I just think you need to enjoy life. Yeah. Don't don't focus on the negative. Focus on the opportunities. Attitude is much better than than ability in my view. Yeah. Because attitude is something that will shape your life and will make you feel good about yourself or potentially bad about yourself as well. So, uh, make your bed every day. Get yourself disciplined. Get yourself in a position yeah. where you set a routine. Um, and Chris, you will be very happy in your life and develop some bounce back ability. I, I, absolutely, and I, it's a crazy American <laughs> phrase, but resilience, if you like, in, yeah. in, 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 in um, the, the English uh, vernacular. But um, you have to find new ways of smiling and new ways of finding uh, a path through um, uh, adversity. And um, but by doing that, you'll be happier, and you'll feel the, the sense of achievement will be spectacular. Super. Well, thank you for that, Chris. No, at all. Really enjoyed nice that. Thank really, you, really good to make it so. You too, thank you for sharing that. Thank you. That's all. And thank you to everyone out there for uh, joining us on this business roots chat. If you want to know more about Space Eye or Chris and his services, then you can find them on the internet. And please look up Robbie's Dream Foundation as well. And if you fancy giving a small donation, then we'd be really grateful for that. Remember, there's more business roots chats out there on your usual podcast platforms where we talk to more interesting people like Chris. Uh, but for now, see you soon.